yeah, we can start. It's five after ten. So all right. Okay. So good morning, everyone. For those who have just arrived, and uh, this is the second lecture of the series uh, of the fourth appointment of the series of theory lecture. We have uh, again the discussive, and uh, we will continue talking about. Uh, non-perturbative methods, modern non-perturbative methods in QFT, zooming in particular on S matrix uh, booster. So then it's, uh, you can start, but before let's speak, uh, just a few words on the, on the format. It will be as it was yesterday. So we can talk for 45, 50 minutes, then have a break that uh, will learn, uh, whose length will depend on the number of questions and then continue with the lecture up to the point that we, we stop and maybe we can discuss later. Till then, it's easier. So this is more or less the format. That's Excellent. all. You um, can uh, you can start. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Davide. All right. So today, I try to give some some general overview. Yesterday, zooming on to onto some details, and today I would like to actually be a little bit more concrete about one particular method, uh, which I'm actively working on currently. So it's. Uh, the easiest subject to present for me, uh, which is uh, S matrix bootstrap. And uh, I would like to get a little bit into details, explain what uh, and how we can uh, put bounds. And uh, I will mention a couple of applications uh, of this method, what we can do with it. And uh, I was thinking to also talk a little bit about the conformal bootstrap. Well, let's see if I have time. Probably not much. Anyway, so to recap, the axioms which we use in the uh, S matrix bootstrap or assumptions, we call them axioms, are crossing, analyticity, maximal analyticity and uh, unitarity. All right, and today I will try to show how we can extract bounds on the S matrices using these three axioms or three assumptions. Uh, but before I, I, I start, I need to recap some of the things uh, which I said yesterday. So, I will be scattering a single, well, a single type of particle here with mass M. So I will be considering the uh, sketching process of this particle. Uh, P1, P2 goes to P3, P4, where, uh, yeah. So we scatter two particles with a special momenta and they scatter and they get momenta P3, P4. So the scattering amplitude, such a scattering amplitude is described by, I'll denote it by symbol S, and it will depend on four momenta, P2, P3, P4. Good, uh, but uh, there's a, always the probability that the particles just miss each other. So the scattering, the full scattering amplitude has a, a, a trivial part. So in order to exclude this trivial part, uh, we also define the interacting part of the scattering amplitude, and I call it by capital tau. And this object depends on the three Mendelstam variables only. Okay. Uh, and since the scattering of scalar particles is a scalar object that should be Lorentz invariance, these are only three objects we can write, and they define in terms of the momenta as follows. S is minus P plus P2 squared p1 minus p4 squared and uh, so these are special parts when i put vector this is like a space time uh, and there is a mass shell condition for for this uh, particle meaning p pi squared is equal to minus m squared. Okay, so this is the full uh, scattering amplitude. 
and this is the uh, interacting part only. So it is also important to project this part, uh, these scattering amplitudes to definite spin. And uh, that's where the notion of partial amplitudes arises. So we can define SJ of S. This is the projection of the full scattering amplitude. And it will, and if we project the interacting part of the scattering amplitude, here's the relation between them. Okay. So the dependence on T and U disappears here. There is none because we integrated out. I will uh, now define the formulas more precisely. Uh, not more precisely, I will define now what is the partial amplitude. But here I should notice that I don't write the relation here precisely, uh, just because I'm a little bit lazy. Uh, here there will be delta functions, uh, which uh, give me a, a free propagation of the of the of the particles, so I, I don't want to bother. And uh, for example, in four dimensions, let me just write the formula in four dimensions for simplicity, but uh, it is, it can be generalized to any, uh, any dimension. So the Tj is equal to some, uh, some kinematic factor Here's the integral from minus one to plus one dx. This is the Legendre polynomial. And here's the interacting part of the sketchy amplitude. Uh, here, the variables t and u depend on s and x. And u depends on s and x. And I re remind you that here x is the cos of theta. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should write here x is cos of theta. And the relation between t and u, more precisely, is given. Let me just copy them. Okay, excellent. So I, I wasn't very careful about these formulas yesterday. Now I wrote them explicitly. So let me comment if you want to go to generic dimensions. So what changes is this uh, Legendre polynomial in uh, generic dimensions and should be replaced by the Gegenbauer polynomial, CJ. You also can go, for instance, consider particles with, uh, with spin in four dimensions, then this, so this is a general D. You can also talk about particles with spin in 4D, for example, then the Legendre polynomial should be replaced by the Wigner DJ matrix. And here there will be helicities of, uh, differences of helicities of, uh, of particles, lambda, lambda prime. Okay, let me see the question. Uh, so this, I write tau. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, cap large tau. Right, so, right. And uh, this, the last thing I need to set up the notation and we can move forward is the inverse relation. So uh, this definition of the partial amplitude, I can, I can invert. And uh, so I can write the actual uh, scattering, interacting part of the scattering amplitude, STU. 
has uh, some coefficients, sum over all spins, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., 4, etc. Uh, here's the Legendre polynomial and the partial amplitudes. Uh, yeah, partial amplitudes, dj of s. And since we are dealing with identical particles, uh, the spin one and spin three, they disappear because of the permutation properties. Good, so uh, spherical symmetry of my problem allows me, so, so here's the function of uh, three variables. Well, if you, ah, yeah, there's a, finally, there's the relation I remind you between s t and u, which is equal to four m squared. So the, the uh, variable u is actually not really independent. So we write it because crossing is very easily written in terms of three variables. The point is, it's not independent, so you can write it or not. And the sketch amplitude depends only on two variables, st. However, spherical symmetry allows me to factorize that dependence and actually split this function into something which depends purely on the kinematics properties. And so this is just kinematics. And this part is the dynamics of my problem. So partial partial uh, amplitudes are good. They just simplify. They they split the dynamics from kinematics. All right. Now let's go to unitarity. I'll, I remind you that for the sketchy amplitudes, unitarity was uh, derived yesterday in the following form given the uh, this matrix where we have the full interacting uh, partial amplitude this matrix should be semi-positive definite given the definition which i gave you just uh, on the previous slide i can further rewrite this I basically should replace SJ by the interacting part. So what I will get is the following thing. Uh, plus zero. All right, so this is the semi-positive uh, definite constraint, and why we like to write it uh, to write it in this form, because there's a uh, there's a powerful technique, numerical technique, uh, which is implemented in the C++ code. This code is called as DPB. Sorry. And basically, it deals with semi-positive definite matrices. And uh, a lot of recent research uh, in S-matrix bootstrap and in uh, conformal bootstrap uh, was due to the existence of such a tool. And basically, the, 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 the general uh, statement, if you can formulate your problem numerically as some set of semi-positive definite matrices, there's a very efficient tool which allows you uh, to, to study such a problem numerically. And uh, basically, many researchers try to formulate whatever interesting problems they have in physics into some positive definite language. Now, before addressing that, let me... Uh, yeah, so, so, so basically, this is the... B is the numerical... numerical methods which use uh, uh, which use SDPB. However, there are other non-perturbative methods which have uh, have been used for like a century and I'll call them dispersion relations.
So these methods uh, in the modern context, they they also called uh, constraints from positivity. I guess in a slang. Sure, I will rem right. I will um, in in the end when I will review. I will, I will review in detail numerical methods which uses DPB in the context of the S matrix bootstrap. And then I will explain precisely uh, what is our numerical problem and what is DPB is, is using. Just uh, stay with me for another 20 minutes. Right, Bef before I do that, I just wanted to talk about dispersion relations. I wanted, and they've been, been used a lot by people and I wanted to discuss them first and what you can get out of them. And then I will compare with a full nu numerical methods. Okay, so let's uh, talk uh, quickly about dispersion relations. So big, this unitarity constraint, to talk about dispersion relations, this unitarity constraint here can be written uh, in this standard, uh, much more standard form. Okay, and uh, if I expand this uh, uh, interact full partial amplitude into interacting part of partial amplitude, uh, I should get this equality. So let me just uh, write it. Okay, to go from first line to, to the second line, I just use uh, uh, this uh, relation. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, excellent. So what you can see, this is the absolute value. So it, it's greater than zero. And um, so right away from this constraint, you see that the imaginary part of the interacting part of the partial scattering amplitude should be greater or equal than zero. So this condition is called, well, people call positivity. But a better name would be linearized unitarity. The problem with the unitarity condition, why it is very difficult to, to, to deal in general, because it's nonlinear. You see the quadratic terms here. However, if you linearize this, well, it's much simpler. And the only linearized unitarity or positivity enters into dispersion relations in, in almost all the techniques which use dispersion relations. Well, all of them, not almost all of them. All right. And, um, and the, the, the goal is to use a full unitarity, which is nonlinear. And the second method here, numerical method with this DPB, allows to do that. However, in some cases, you don't need to use full unitarity. Uh, for example, if you talk about weakly coupled theories, you know that, uh, for example, if you take uh, phi to the fourth theory again in uh, phi to the fourth theory in Pesky and Schroeder, you know that at three level, the sketchy amplitude is, uh, is minus lambda uh, plus uh, corrections. And if Lambda is small, well, this tau is small. And you can easily neglect uh, the quadratic terms here. So the bottom line, when you use positivity in the dispersion relations, it gives you 
non-perturbative constraints, very good constraints, uh, rigorous, what I mean, rigorous, but they're non-optimal because you don't use everything. But for weakly coupled theories, it's probably good enough. Uh, the full uh, unitarity, non-linear unitarity doesn't bring you any new information. Okay. And uh, let me now give you a flavor what uh, unitary, uh, these dispersion relations can do. So the, the idea is the following. Uh, analyticity, max, the assumption of maximal analyticity tells me that I have this uh, branch cut and nothing else anywhere else. Due to crossing, this branch cut gets reflected to here. So in the end, I have two branch cuts. I could also have poles here, but I assume that I don't have any for simplicity. And uh, maximum test, it tells me that the function uh, tau of s when t is fixed to some physical value, then uh, this object can be promoted to the full complex plane in s, and it's analytic there. What I can do then is to pick some random point uh, as zero and uh, draw a contour around this point, contour gamma. Then I can write this the following relation. Take tau s and t fixed. S minus s zero ds. And the, there is the contour integral over this contour gamma. The Cauchy theorem tells me that this should be equal to 2 pi tau of S0 t fixed. OK. And um, Oh, well, one definition I, I, I forgot to, to write. Uh, so yesterday I defined the parameters lambda, which described amplitude, lambda KL, and they were defined as uh, the scattering, the interacting part of the scattering amplitude at, uh, for, for example, at some, at some point. And this point is, it is convenient to choose it to be 4m squared over three. And here I can put uh, derivatives, K and, uh, and L. And here's some number to make a lambda KL dimensionless and some factorials just because they're nice. So this lambda KL, they describe my amplitude non-perturbatively. So you see already, if I pick, for example, here, the point S0, not to be here, but somewhere here, to be 4m squared over 3. And I can also pick t to be 4m squared uh, over 3. Then, then this, this part here will be proportional to my uh, lambda 0, 0. OK. And what uh, the dispersion relation tells you is that the, this uh, coefficient lambda 0, 0 is related to some in the contour integral. Uh, I, I'm trying to be very schematic and I, I skip uh, several subtleties, which I will mention in the end. I'm trying just to give uh, generic logic. Now, the contour integral here, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the Cauchy theorem, there is a statement that uh, the integration doesn't depend on the form of the closed contour. So I can deform it at my will and, uh, well, that's how I would like to deform it. So this is my point S0. So I deform it and I expand it to infinity. But uh, clearly, the, the branch cuts, by definition, we are cutting that part of the complex plane. So you cannot cross the branch cuts. 
So at most, what you can do is to draw uh, this contour. This is the com as complex plane. All right. And uh, let me for a second assume that uh, the sketchy amplitude, amplitude, the interacting part tau, uh, decays uh, fast at infinity, which is not true, but let me assume uh, for now. So I can ignore the contours here. And then basically the integration go, ah, yeah. I also need to draw the, the directions. Okay. Now, so the by assumption, I, I drop the contour at infinity. And what I would like to uh, think about only is the integration around this branch cut. And uh, this part here, Part here would be equal to T S plus I epsilon. So you see uh, along the branch cut, S is foam squared, foam squared to higher. But because I want to stay a little bit above the branch cut, I need to add uh, an I epsilon uh, in the uh, vertical direction. Right? And uh, the integration below the branch cut, it comes, the, the direction is different, so I get a minus. But also because the, the, the integration goes below the cut, what I have is S minus I epsilon. Okay. And uh, this you can rewrite since S, I assume, well, S here now is a real number, it's foam squared. Uh, I can simply rewrite it as ts plus i epsilon minus tau star s plus i epsilon okay and this gives me simply the 2i imaginary part of tau and uh, of course I, I forgot here the t t is is uh, is fixed it's just some parameter so I forgot T. Okay, so when you do this integral, what basically you get from the dispersion relation, let me just uh, write it schematically so I don't, don't, don't care about the, the numbers. Uh, so this will be equal integral from 4m squared to infinity, imaginary part of uh, tau st uh, s minus s zero, and s zero now is chosen to be four m squared over three. Right. So this uh, this uh, this is the part of the integral from the branch right branch cut. The thing is, you can do exactly the same thing in the left. And due to crossing, the result there will be proportional to result. Uh, well, it will be related to result for the right integration. Right? Plus, so there will be second part. But this second part will be written exactly like this one. It's just uh, um, S so will be replaced by, uh, I think, by U. Right. So, so it, right. Very good. Uh, so, so let me just uh, just uh, forget about this part. I will show in, in, in a second the precise relation. But anyway, so this is the dispersion relation which relates you the parameter lambda zero zero to the integral over the imaginary part. And uh, I just, uh, you can then rewrite this uh, scattering amplitude in terms of partial amplitudes, tau j, and, and Legendre polynomials. 
And uh, due to unitarity, the imaginary part here will be greater or equal than zero. And for example, from, from if if this were true, what I was saying, you conclude that uh, the the coefficient lambda zero zero is greater or equal than zero. Okay, and this is the application of uh, of uh, dispersion relations and linearized unitarity. Now, what is not true in this derivation is that uh, the scattering amplitude at infinity decays. However, this is easily can be taken into account because there is the frost sub bound. Frost sub bound basically tells you that the amplitude for uh, S uh, large, much greater than four M squared, uh, goes as S, if I'm not mistaken, log square S. So you can take in practice this into account by saying that if I take my uh, interacting part of the sketchy amplitude and divide it by S squared and send S now to infinity, this should be zero. And uh, so basically uh, in the previous slide, if you use so-called two subtractions, so instead of talking about uh, the dispersion relations for this quantity, I just, I will talk about the dispersion relation about this quantity then everything goes through, you can drop the contour. And uh, let me show you the formulas uh, you, you, you get in, in general. Now, if you take everything carefully into account, uh, you basically get uh, this relation. This is the dispersion relation I, I wanna show you. The left-hand side is the, the residue of my amplitude. And here I have as zero as one as many points they're just points in the complex plane i picked and uh, you can choose whatever convenient values for you if you choose them very conveniently so uh, the left hand side the left hand side here uh, picks up uh, my non-perturbative parameters of the amplitude uh, sorry it pick, picks up for instance lambda to zero it pick up, picks up lambda uh, to one, etc. And notice that because when we introduce two subtractions, you cannot anymore, you, you're not sensitive. These dispersion relations, they're not sensitive anymore to lambda zero zero. So you cannot really bound it from here. In the right hand side, I have the integral over uh, the physical parameters for m squared to plus infinity. Here is the imaginary part of the partial amplitude. And this due to linearized entirety is greater or equal than zero. And hj is some kinematic function. It, this kinematic function appears because, well, I have to integrate right branch cut and left branch cut. And it also, it is defined basically here. It includes the Legendre polynomials or uh, Gegenbauer polynomials in generic D but it's no one kinematic function. Uh, and uh, in the range of integration, it's always positive, you can check. So you can get now using this dispersion relation, you try to get various bounds. And uh, this te technology was recently got uh, a lot of attention. Uh, for instance, the, well, I, I will name some authors. Uh, the, Simon Karaniot, uh, he wrote a nice paper where he uses uh, these dispersion relations and this positivity. He just round a nice language, how to implement all this constraint in, in the efficient way and very, very elegant way. But the similar constraints obtained by another group in, for instance, Imperial College by uh, uh, Andrew Tolli and uh, Claudia Deram, also people in uh, Lausanne like Ricardo, Francesco Riva, etc. they get uh, these bounds. And uh, if you apply their technology. Well, I prefer the language of uh, Simon, but they're all equivalent. Uh, what you can get, let me go back. Uh, using these dispersion relations, uh, of course, I'm, I'm skipping all the steps, but I'm trying to give the overview. 
uh, you can get, for example, this bound lambda two comma one less or equal than minus nine over sixteen lambda to zero. And here is the numerical number 15, 219, lambda 20. And uh, why the number here is numerical? Well, even though your dispersion relation is analytic, uh, there are a lot of constraints you want to take into account. I didn't go into details of these tools, but if you do them and do take them into account, the efficient way is to use Mathematica, for example, there's a beautiful linear optimization function and uh, it's really it takes seconds to compute uh, this number but you need to use a little bit uh, numerical input great so this is the first bound non-perturbative bound which is uh, true for any theory you can think of which obeys my assumptions now can we do better and the answer is yes we can do better And uh, yeah, by the way, are there any questions at, 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 this, uh, at this stage? Right, yeah. Thank you for the link to SDPB. Actually, I can ask something. So uh, this, in the dispersion relation, what really appears is the discontinuity, and then we use uh, real uh, analytistic ref reflection principle to, to relate it to the imaginary part. Is this an independent assumption? I don't really understand if it's an independent assumption or if it just follows from unitarity and then let this the usual thing, this uh, reflection principle. I think it's just a part uh, of the statement that there's one branch cut and the function is analytic everywhere else. I uh, don't think it's an extra assumption. Okay. And what you refer here, yes. So th this is uh, exactly, this is the, this thing here, just writing, is the uh, discontinuity of uh, tau along the branch cut in, in the S variable. Yeah, what people will say that the function is real analytic, but uh, yeah, there is an official definition of real authenticity from mathematicians and loose definition from physicists. I think uh, what people really mean, yeah, maybe there is a tiny extra assumption. So they, they, okay, good. I think the statement is that the function is analytic everywhere, but it has to be real uh, between this branch cut on the real axis. Uh, let me use another color. So in this area on the on the real axis, there's a statement of unit. Uh, there's a statement that it should be real, right? And combined with analyticity, I think uh, this property follows. Uh, this one goes here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, exactly. Uh, thank, thank you for the questions. So I assume here that there are no poles in this area. If you have poles, then uh, the contour picks up contributions from each of those poles. I just ignore them completely for, for simplicity. But you, you're absolutely right. Uh, if, you, if you have poles, uh, you have to include them. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, if you for, for example, I assume for simplicity that my particles, which are scattered, they have plus M and they are Z2 odd under uh, some Z2 symmetry. Then the poles are forbidden by this symmetry. Sorry, Danny, said just a comment also regarding Antonio's question. I think he's an extra assumption. This one, uh, yeah, I agree with you with what you said. I think that there is an extra assumption in uh, the right in the continuity, the discontinuity like this one. So it was just to, to comment on this. Yeah, the, the, because it's like the, saying the, the, that it's satisfying the reflection principle. No? It's called like this, I think. 
I'm not sure, but I think is an is an extra property of a function. It's not from free by assuming what just you you have to to impose. I, I think that the the extra uh, extra statement which is here that uh, the function is real on the uh, between the branch cuts. Yeah, the, I think uh, and yeah, that, that that is it. Yeah, I think you're right. No, it was just to yeah to to comment that I also think is something more. Okay. So before the break, I would like, oh, um, oh yeah, uh, let's try uh, to to finish. We started five minutes later. Yeah, so you have time. Start. We can have the break also a bit later. It's not a problem. I have, uh, yeah. Let, let's try logically to finish this uh, this part and then take a break a bit later. I'll take maybe uh, fifteen minutes. Okay. So. Uh, part B. So how can we use uh, full nonlinear unitarity constraints? And this is the numerical approach propo was proposed some time ago by, by Joao Pinedonis, Pedro Vieira, Baltan Ries, uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel Paulos, uh, and uh, uh, John Toledo. Basically the idea, it, but I also should say that there's one approach but uh, there are similar in spirit approaches, which are in some cases better, in, in some cases worse. And uh, one can still might think that in the future we'll have even better approach if you don't like this one in particular. Well, when I saw this approach in the beginning, I didn't like it too much because it feels like it involves too many, uh, like uh, you have to put things by hand, a lot of things by hand, but it works and it is very easy to implement. Maybe in the future, there are some ongoing works, we'll get a little bit better approaches. Anyway, keep that in mind. So it's not the approach, but it's easy to explain, easy to implement, and you get uh, interesting results from it. So let me define the row variable in the complex plane, like the, uh, well, in the S complex plane as follows. Excellent. So S0 is just a parameter of my definition. I can pick it uh, at will. For example, I can again pick my favorite point for m squared over three. And uh, the important part here uh, the, is this square root here and this uh, square root here. You see, in the when S in the physical region, S in greater than four m squared. So the, uh, the square root becomes negative, so you get the branch cut. Basically, what this uh, row variable tells you is that it incorporates automatically the branch cut which, which you have in your theory. Now, what you can do using this row variable, take uh, my interacting part of the scattering amplitude as uh, T and U, and uh, let me uh, take the row variable in S to some power, row variable in T, and row in U to some power. A, B, C are just powers. And then I will sum these uh, row variables with some coefficients, uh, alpha with indices A, B, C. And uh, the indices A, B, and C start from zero and go to infinity. Okay. So these are just the coefficients. Coefficients, okay? So basically I would like to write uh, an ansatz for my interacting part of the scattering amplitude like this. And this ansatz takes care automatically of the analytic properties uh, on, on, the, on the S uh, complex plane. <clears throat> because of the construction, how the row variables are constructed. Uh, so analyticity here is okay. So you can think about this ansatz as an expansion uh, in, in terms of a complete uh, basis of functions, which are wrong. So first assumption is met. 
the second assumption we uh, use crossing. So crossing uh, tells me that uh, I should be able to permute, uh, well, in the practical language, uh, S, T, and U as I want, and the function doesn't change. So if you apply, apply it to these ansatz, you will see that the, the uh, coefficients alpha, beta, alpha, A, B, C should be fully symmetric in the indices A, B, and C. Okay, crossing checked. Well, imposed in this way. And uh, one should remember that there is also the relation S plus T plus uh, U equal to 4M squared. You have to take this into account. And this will, uh, this relation, if you impose it systematically, it will kill uh, some, some alpha alpha coefficients okay you 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 have to impose that but uh, i don't want to talk about this technical issue so the final thing which remains to impose is the unitarity and uh, in order to do that we take this sketchy amplitude uh, the interacting part of the sketching amplitude and project to uh, to to partial amplitudes and uh, let me just remind you, since I can just scroll back. Uh, so the, the partial amplitude here, Tj of s, this one here, uh, is defined as the integral of the sketching amplitude with the, with the Legendre polynomials. So what we can do here, What, uh, what we can do here, we just uh, integrate these row variables with the genre polynomials, and uh, we obtain some tj, the object tj of s, which will be a sum of a, b, c, starting from zero to infinity, the unknown parameters in the ansatz, a, b, c, and let me put symmetrization here. And then when I integrated uh, these guys with Legendre polynomials, I will get some integrals. Let me call them just int schematically. They will depend on spin, they will depend on s, and they will depend on parameters a, b, and c. Okay. So in, in practice, uh, this integration uh, is very hard to do analytically with Legendre polynomials. So in practice, we compute uh, these integrals numerically for given values of s. But uh, you can ignore this difficulty. In one way or another, you can get these functions, integral s. So, so what we arrive at is the ansatz for the partial amplitude. Now, the last thing I need to do, I need to plug these partial amplitudes in the unitarity constraints. And what I get is things like 1, 1, yeah, uh, again, let me just scroll back since I can remind you that the unitarity was, was uh, given here and it can be written in the following form here, right? And I'll just plug my answer inside. Uh, right, and, and before I do it, uh, let me just schematically write. So what here I can do is the uh, let me just rewrite my partial amplitude as the vector of unknown coefficients alpha and i put vector to remove this abc indices and here i'll have a vector of my integrals for given uh, for given s like that so then if i plug uh, this uh, thing in the entirety constraints what i get is the following objects alpha times zero zero i integral of s vector and here i'll get minus i integral And this thing should be semi-positive definite. Okay, that is my 
last formula. Sorry, right. I just have a question. Yes, please. Do you have a um, convincing way to motivate the answers you did, like ABC, the writing this matrix like this one? I can understand that uh, why you did it and how much, more or less the way it works, but uh, I'm not sure of the structure of it because it reproduces the singularities. No, but no, no. So uh, I, I assume that there are no singularities and no poles. So if you have poles, for example, the, the one I, I got a question before, you can have poles, then you have to add them by hand. Poles. Here. No, I mean the branch cuts. This reproduces the this what I mean. Exactly. They, 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 so yeah, exactly. They, they reproduce the branch cuts. But no other justification. I mean, it could have been another function with a different structure that would do the same job, or there is a, a more solid way to justify this choice. Oh, no, no, no. Any, any function will do. Any function which has the same analytic property will do. And probably there are better, better choices. This row variable is just very simple. Uh, I, I personally think about this row variables as think about the Fourier transform. Uh, you can always expand some function in terms of the sines and cosines, some real function. Yeah, it's, exactly. a, it's a complete uh, basis of functions. Uh, exactly, these are is a complete basis of function. Uh, I, I think so. I, I'm not sure it is proven, but I think it can be proven. Okay, okay. No, I was missing this detail. Okay, so you can. Uh, okay, now now it makes sense. And you're saying that it's not optimal. If it is complete, it must be an optimal choice. But you're saying it is not. No, no. It it, it is great. If if you if you can take infinite uh, number of terms in this ansatz, so if you keep this infinite, uh, then. Uh, then yeah, anything can be reproduced, any function. Okay. In practice. So you see, what you want to do in practice is to determine. That's what I'm coming now. To determine uh, in the bootstrap uh, the parameters alpha in your answers. If you have any particular model. Yeah, I see. I see. No, no, I understand the logic. Alpha. It's like a bootstrap equation, no? The one uh, more or less. Uh, so yeah so you see what what happens let me just go back so in practice to do anything the logic is the following we impose the analyticity check we impose crossing this is check the last thing which remains is to impose unitarity here and i wrote unitarity in this in this form right and now the numerical part this dpb part comes in first thing you should do uh, you want to replace instead of taking the infinite ansatz, you want to replace it by some finite value of n max. Okay, and this is an unsatisfactory part of the uh, of the numerical procedure. I say it right away. You can all only work with finite value of n max, so with finite number of terms in the ansatz. But uh, the true results will be given only at the infinite number of terms. So whatever you get, you have to extrapolate. To, to infinite value of terms, and uh, this is the the pr problematic part of the of the of the method. In two dimensions, you don't need to extrapolate. It's very well. The extrapolation is very easy. In high dimensions, it becomes uh, more and more difficult. Now, the, the the statement is the following: You want to numerically determine the coefficients alpha such that uh, this unitarity constraint is always true for every value s greater than uh, or equal than 4m squared, real values, OK? So in practice, what you can do, you can discretize, and discretize the value of s, and this matrix becomes numerical, OK? And uh, you ask uh, SDPB. SDPB is the program which tries to find these parameters alpha such that this condition is always true. Okay, that's what this DPB does. Now, there are clearly infinite number of solutions for alpha because you can think about different theories, different values of alpha, which give you unitary constraints for any value of S greater or equal than 4M squared. So you would like to specify some, some extra condition. And this extra condition is, uh, for example,
you you can take your ansatz here and you uh, using this ansatz you basically want to compute the lambda zero zero the coupling which describes my amplitude and uh, i remind you by definition lambda zero zero is just uh, tau of s equal to t equal to u equal to 4m squared divided by three so when you plug this value in the ansatz you will get uh, uh, basically some linear combinations of alphas alpha abc with some numerical coefficients right and uh, what you would like to ask is to maximize lambda zero lambda zero zero or you can require minimize in sdpb you can require minimize lambda zero zero which means that maximize or minimize this linear combination of alphas such that this condition the unitarity condition is always true okay and if you run this numerical procedure for example you can get the bound on lambda zero zero you can get roughly the bound minus 600 plus 200 okay and this is the full non-perturbative bounds numerical non-perturbative bound so i need an, uh, two more minutes to compare two approaches but i will take like a pause for 30 seconds and uh, um, and maybe one someone has a quick question here i have a quick question so usually in stpb we we don't need to just have matrices of numbers we can have matrices of polynomials is it completely obvious that we cannot pull out some positive factor and have matrices of polynomials in s here mm -hmm. Good. So in uh, yeah in in conformal bootstrap, uh, so in 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 conformal bootstrap, uh, you did you you formulate something as a semi-positive definite, and these objects like int in conformal bootstrap they become rational functions of the scaling dimension. The s plays the role in in the conformal bootstrap. S, s becomes delta, and you have a rational function. The thing is, in this rational function, the denominator is always positive, so you can pull it out. And what you get, this int becomes the polynomial in delta. And then as DPB is optimized to deal with these polynomials, and you need do not need to discretize over delta. Unfortunately, in the S matrix bootstrap, this int of S is a very complicated function. It's not rational. In fact, we don't even have the analytic expression for it. We compute it numerically uh, for discretized value of s so unfortunately you cannot use that uh, that uh, that trick here thanks okay uh, so uh, here that this is the, the numerical bound you can get from uh, from from this approach fully non-perturbative numerical approach and I, I, uh, now, if you use dispersion relations, the dispersion relations generically cannot say anything about this lambda zero zero, because you need to use subtractions. And now let's see how the two methods compare. And here's the plot I briefly mentioned before. So uh, here's uh, the bound, the two dimensional bound on lambda two one zero and lambda two zero zero. Why I choose this plot? Because the dispersion relations can say something about lambda 2, 0 and lambda 2, 1. And the dispersion relations, they give me these dashed lines. And they say that everything which is inside is OK. This is the best thing you can do. And this is the, uh, yeah, the rigorous bound. Uh, and I remind you that this bound uses the linearized unitarity or how people call it positivity, that the imaginary part of Tj is greater or equal than zero. However, if you use the full uh, non-perturbative, non-linear unitarity, then you get this island, and this is now the allowed region. And you see how much better 
uh, the full non perturbative numerical approach is doing compared to the positivity. On this plot, you, you can see the difficulty with the method, that the method is computed with a finite number of terms. And uh, what you would like to do is to extrapolate this n max to infinity, given this data. And you see that the, the true island, it, uh, it grows uh, right, but it's, the growth slow, slows down. And the true, true island will, will be maybe somewhere here. One can do the extrapolation. And this is the unsatisfactory part of, the, of, the numerical, of, of this particular method. Last comment before, before I conclude, let's look at perturbative theories. So in perturbative theories, the scattering amplitude tau is, uh, is, uh, is small. Uh, so all these coupling constants, lambda to zero. Uh, lambda to zero and uh, Lambda to one. Uh, sorry, here what what I wanted to say is much less than than one. Uh, okay, so basically the perturbative region is somewhere here. And as I mentioned to you, for the perturbative part, you can actually ignore the full nonlinear unitarity and use only linearized unitarity. And you can see how nicely the, the numerical bounds from two different, uh, the two, two bounds from two different approaches uh, just uh, coincide. But as, as soon as you go to the non perturbative regime in, in this area, well, the dispersion relations, they, they become very weak. Okay. So I'll, I'll stop the first part of today here. Thank you. Okay, we can have a discussion. So if then is, is available for 10 minutes, let's say, depending on the discussion. And then we can start again, let's say, now tentatively, we can say 11.15. And uh, yeah, that's it. So. I will be here and uh, yeah, also Dennis. Um, we can start again in uh, 10 minutes, something less. Dennis, let me ask something about the, the positivity stuff. Sure. So when, the, okay, so here they have to solve it, to solve it bounds on this ratio, lambda to one over lambda to zero. Okay. But you could never, positivity could not, never provide for you an upper bound on lambda to zero, right? Or, or it can also. No, I don't. No, I don't think you you get an upper bound. Right. I don't think you get an upper bound uh, for lambda to zero. Right. Um, yeah. So uh, basically, sometimes you get both upper and lower bound, like in the case of lambda to one, and uh, in the language of uh, the paper of Karen Newold, but uh, you can probably reformulate in, in any other language of people uh, doing positivity, uh, there is the null constraint. Right. And uh, which comes uh, in, in turn from crossing. Yeah, but sometimes you don't have these null constraints. Another thing, uh, like a more technical comment, what I'm talking about here is, uh, is the case of, with, of a mass gap. So we have a particle with a finite mass. And then everything I say is rigorous. However, somehow people mostly talk about uh, positivity in the context of massless particles. Well, probably because they're physically more interesting because you have pions, you have photons, you have gravitons in higher dimensions. And uh, there, uh, it's a bit tricky. Some of the bounds, I still am, maybe they are, but at the current state of research, it's not convincing that they are rigorous because they are locks and people ignore those logs. Uh, right. In the massive case here, there's no such a problem because we have a natural uh, mass gap. Right.
good. So I'll take a few minutes break. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. So maybe we can start. What do you think, Dennis? Uh, sure. Uh, let me just ask if uh, there are any questions uh, first, and then we'll continue. OK. It seems there are no. All so right. maybe we can start. And uh, yeah, I have the last tranche of these lectures. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. Let's continue. Um, Excellent. So um, there have been a lot of applications of this current method. And for example, uh, this method, uh, the S matrix bootstrap method is uh, very su successful in uh, two dimensions where uh, various interesting bounds were studied. And on, on these bounds, uh, you get sometimes integral models and the numerical results reproduce those integral models. Uh, so in two dimensions, there was uh, the one I mentioned already yesterday, there was an approach to combine, uh, so first 2D, a lot of S matrix bootstrap bound. Bounds. Uh, and uh, they look consistent with, uh, they reproduce uh, known integrable models. Also in 2D, there was an attempt um, to combine uh, S matrix uh, bootstrap with, uh, with Hamiltonian truncation bootstrap, Hamiltonian truncation uh, to, to study the phi to the four uh, model non-perturbatively. Now in, in four dimensions, uh, people studied pions, uh, massless and massive, Uh, massive, and uh, uh, there was also in the massive case there was an attempt to inject some of the experimental data inside the bootstrap to get uh, instead of getting a generic bound, try to identify the, the QCD point. So in 4D there will be uh, hopefully uh, the paper coming out soon photon bootstrap of photons of massless spin one particles, and uh, in 10D. Uh, people studied uh, supergravity. So there are a lot of applications. However, what I would like to, to, to mention today is uh, another direction where these methods can be applied. Uh, so one can try to combine the S matrix approach uh, with uh, something else, with some uh, so something something else. So this something else could be, uh, like uh, I explained yesterday, could could be form factors, and uh, and the spectral density. Uh, you you can combine and inject them in the setup, or you can. For, for instance, this, this works in general D, all dimensions. Or you could try to add, in, in four dimensions, you could try to add the probe or compensator field, uh, probe, uh, which uh, in, in Kamagotsky trimmer called the dilaton. Uh, to actually probe the theory and uh, extract the anomaly. So what I was doing, I was uh, in the last few years, I was exploring uh, the conceptual possibilities of extending the S matrix. Uh, but by, by S matrix, I mean basically uh, unitarity conditions. Uh, 
in entirety conditions uh, to extend them uh, so that they could include the form factors and spectral densities, or they could include the dilaton scattering. And once you have the, uh, the setup, the, the, the analytic setup, you can apply the, the, the approach I just said, but not only including like the scattering of a physical particle, but for instance, you can write an answer for the form factor or for the spectral density and uh, just study them all together. Or you can uh, write an answer for the uh, for the uh, for the dilaton probe and study the A anomaly together with the sketching matrix. And um, why? So, so so basically, I would like to to distinguish logically. So there is a theoretical part, the conceptual part, where you write your unitarity constraints, and then to to get any mileage out of these constraints, you then apply some of your favorite numerical methods. And in practice, I apply that particular one I described you, but you can apply any other methods in the future, better methods, maybe. Okay. And, um, and what uh, this direction allows me, if you, if you look at the energy scale, as I already mentioned that, but I will repeat anyway. So, uh, Here's the infinite energy. This is the zero energy. Uh, when you compute non-perturbative matrix, it's unitary along the whole energy spectrum. Uh, scattering. So it is well defined. Uh, and uh, at very high energies, you have the UV CFT. Unfortunately, uh, the scattering matrix is such a tricky observable. Uh, because it's formulated in the language in the degrees of freedom of, of low energy in terms of particles. So it's very hard to extract the uh, UV information out of, out of it. So even if, even if you know the scattering amplitude to very high energies, uh, you cannot really extract anything. Well, at least we don't know. There are a couple of conjectures, but uh, not any proven statement. All right. And, uh, and that's what I was saying. In order to relate the scattering amplitude with the, uh, with the UVCFT data, uh, I try to convince you that you can write the following unitarity constraint. Uh, so that is what we already used today, but then you can enlarge it by adding the form factor. So schematically, I'll write it like this, F. And here's the spectral density, and this should be greater or equal than zero. Right, and uh, today, let me, yesterday I derived this quantity and uh, today, uh, this, this condition, and today let me just show some applications, what you can actually do with that. And um, the example I would like to consider is the 2D sine Gordon model. So, the Lagrangian in the in the UV of, of the sine Gordon model uh, is given by the kinetic term. So this is the uh, phi is the free uh, is the boson field. This is the kinetic term. So it gives me the free CFT. And uh, I, I just remind you in some, some standard conventions, the central charge of the free uh, bosonic CFT is given by C equal one. And now you would like to, so this is my UV CFT, it's just this. And now I would like to deform it plus the deformation. And the deformation is given by the uh, sine of beta phi plus contact terms. And this is my deformation. Should be cosine, no? Um, I don't remember. Uh, the potential should have a quadratic term, right? So oh, yes. thank you, cosine. thank you. Good, excellent. Good. 
So uh, M0 is the, uh, the mass-like parameter, so it's bare parameter. And con so the context terms are chosen such that there are no singularities, no non divergences. So M0 is finite. Beta is the parameter of the theory, main parameter. Uh, and uh, M0, for instance, you can set to one. Now, the, 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 the interesting thing in, in two dimensions that uh, the, the dimension, uh, mass dimension of the phi is zero. And uh, that is the reason why we can form such a bizarre term cosine of beta phi. This would not be allowed in any higher dimensions. But since phi is uh, dimensionless and beta is dimensionless, well, you can do that. And uh, so th this model is integrable, but uh, I always thought if the model is integrable, then you can just compute everything you want. And you just, yeah. But uh, it's much more subtle when you, when you read the papers, uh, it's much more subtle. And not, not everything comes for free. And, in any case, uh, one can use some classical approximations and to determine the spectrum of particles at low energies. And it turns out there's a, uh, there, there, there are many particles and let me denote them, their masses by M1, M2, uh, etc. Okay. So, very good. Now, what I would like to do is to uh, suppose I set up my uh, S matrix bootstrap. So this is the definition of the sign Gordon model. And suppose, suppose I study the sketchy amplitude. Well, let me also write the interacting part of the sketchy amplitude. Uh, and I'll, I'll just write them one just to indicate that it, it's the lightest particle. It, it does not necessarily. So this is a generic scattering amplitude. But I'll, yeah. Uh, here I'll put them one just to indicate that it's, uh, uh, it's the lightest particle in my theory. And then I'll, I'll assume the following form. I'll assume that there's a pole uh, due to some other particle in my theory. And the rest is uh, analytic. So analytic, I mean, it will be more my raw series. OK. And uh, I will just give you the result. So if you run the numerical procedures I described yesterday and you parameterize the form factors, the spectral density, you can construct the following bound. This is the central charge in the EV. And uh, why the central charge now can be probed here, I remind you that the raw is sensitive if to, to C. And uh, more precisely, uh, C is given by, by an integral uh, some numerical factors starting from 4m squared, CUV uh, to infinity, uh, ds rho of s to some power. I think it's a cube that I don't remember. Okay, so that's how the central charge enters. So what you can ask the following problem, you can minimize, uh, so, so, so the setup is as follows. Uh, in the UV, I have some CFT in the IR, I have uh, at least two particles, M1 and M2. And if I sketch the lightest particle M1, uh, I get one pole, but only due to the second particle, to M2. And the question is, uh, what can be the value of the central charge in the UV such that this scattering process is allowed and it's unitary uh, at all the energies? And uh, one example, what one could do is to, to build this uh, two-dimensional plot where you uh, draw the values of G versus the central charge. And the values of G, uh, G is the uh, residue of this pole. They cannot be, they cannot be too big. There is a, there is a, 
cut here. And then we're basically for every value of G, let me minimize the central charge. And what, what you find is the following graph. Okay. So the loud region is here, loud. And the, the minimum value is, is one and a half. And, and you know that one half is the lowest uh, value you can have in two dimensional safeties. And when G gets to some, to this boundary, uh, the central charge uh, starts trying to approach one. Okay. And let me, let me show this plot here. Well, all right, so this is the, the plot from the paper. So here's the central chart. This is the value of G. This is the critical value. And then it starts approaching one. So, and I remind you one is what we expect to get. Right. Sorry, and, Dennis, I have a few questions. Yes, and the actual value is 0 0.8 here. Yes, please. So um, can you go back to the previous slide? Absolutely. <clears throat> So I wanted to ask you, how is G depending on beta? On the parameter beta of the model? Excellent. So good. So um, more or less, uh, just to have an idea. Uh, just to be sure. So this is the model here. This is the model. Um, sorry. So the 2D sign Gordon model, this is the model. Okay. And beta is the Bayer parameter. It's, and uh, you can compute in this model your observables, like the physical mass spectrum M1, M2, M3. You can compute scattering amplitudes, scattering amplitudes. You can compute uh, form factors and spectral densities in terms of beta. And these expressions, uh, well, you have some integrable results. They're very non-trivial. They're, 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 they're very difficult. In, in fact, I don't, I don't think there's a, I don't, ah, yeah. So that are analytic expressions, okay? However, when I go to this, uh, this angle here, I don't assume any model. I don't assume the 2D sine Gordon model. I'm just saying that suppose I study some scattering amplitude and there are two particles only, M1, M2. And I have, uh, and it, it's again, it's my assumption that it has only one pole and it has particle two contributing to the, this pole only. So if I have a scattering amplitude on this form, what are the allowed parameters in, in this scattering amplitude? And this question covers all possible models, not only the sine Gordon model, but whatever you want, given that the scattering amplitude has this form. And, uh, sorry, yeah, e, okay, no, I understand. Okay. Yeah, I understand, okay, sorry, I was, uh, I was uh -huh. missing. Okay. And uh, when you look at this plot, when you look at this plot, uh, so the, so the, the allowed values of G, so any anything is allowed here, so uh, allowed. So G is bounded from unitarity. Course, no. uh, right. What so you... this is this is the bound from unitarity, not allowed. Okay, and uh, and this oh. you, you can you can get this result by studying purely as matrix bootstrap as I was with the method I explained yeah, before, exactly. and you get this bound. Perfect. So what happens if you just study the pure as catching uh, as matrix bootstrap? Then G everything is allowed here, and maybe there are some models here, non non integrable, whatever. Maybe they're just. Uh, just uh, some functions would just obey all my assumptions, but they are not coming from any model. This I don't know. But in this particular point, for this particular G, if you read off this value, and this plot is given for the value of mass two square root of three, from this number and this number, you can compare it now with a particular, with a sine Gordon model. And you see that the S matrix you extract from this point is identical. So 
Okay, but uh, sorry, but you were assuming that uh, the particle M1 is only, how to say, propagating in the scattering a particle of mass M2. This is true in the is true in the San Gordon. Yes, it is true. Okay. Uh, that, that's why we, we picked this setup because you know that in in in, in that class of scattering matrices, you will the side Gordon will be there. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, I was a little bit too quick either. Thank you for, for, for asking. Basically, uh, this bound on G you get uh, you get uh, from the running pure non perturbative S matrix bootstrap. And that's how you discover that on the boundary of the allowed region for G, you, you have the sign Gordon. You just compare the numerics and the analytics and voila. But, uh, with, uh, but you can do even more because we mix the form factors and spectral densities in the setup. Now you can for every given G, you can bound the central charge of your UV, which was never been possible before. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see for the most values of G, you get a boring bound here. There's nothing happening. It's like a C greater than one half is a standard unitarity bound from in, in conformal field theories. However, when you approach G to the critical value where you know that the sine cord is sitting, the bound shoots up. And uh, here you recover 8.0. Uh, and uh, what you would probably want to recover is one. But anyway, so the reason we don't recover one, but we recover 0 0.8 is because the spectral density uh, can be split uh, as a sum of form factors, two particle form factor, four particle form factor plus F. Uh, particle six form factor, etc. And in our setup, we only deal with two particle form factors. We don't add the high ones. And then if you compute the central charge, so the central charge is uh, roughly the integral over rho over ds, you can see that form factor two gives you this contribution to the central charge, c6, etc. And this number, if you compute it in the sine Gordon model, is exactly 0 0.8. And if you compute the four particle form factor, it will be 0 0.19. And then C6 is very small, it's negligible. Okay, I see. Right. So we precisely uncover the number we expect from the sine Gordon model. Okay, okay. so the, just to summarize, uh, you you can actually write unitarity constraints using more observables, not only sketching matrices, but spectral densities. And they get they are sensitive uh, to uh, central charges in 2D, for example, of your UV CFT. And you can draw mixed bounds between central charges and the couplings of US matrix. And you can do, apply this, uh, this bounds for many more in many other co contexts contexts in uh, into the now uh, let me uh, show you another application um, another application which I would like to show is uh, four dimensions So in four dimensions, what you can do is to, uh, suppose I have a particle, particle with mass M and it is Z2 odd. And I will call this particle A. This is a particle in my original theory. But I also extend my theory, a uh, uh, la Kam Kamargotsky and Schwimmer in the proof of the A theorem by adding the, uh, the probe, probe particle or the compensator particle, which they, they call dilaton. Uh, and I'll call this particle B. This particle is massless instead, so particle B is massless. What you can do, uh, yeah, and this particle B uh, comes with a parameter F 
and uh, if you send f to infinity the, this particle completely decouples from the system okay it does not perturb the system anymore and what you can write you can write the system of sketchy amplitudes in in this is in 4d where aa goes to aa a b goes to a b and bb goes to bb so now it's the system of mixed uh, scale amplitudes and the good thing about it here in this scattering amplitude if you if you consider the interacting part tau bb goes to bb it is sent it is it is goes like this it is starts with s squared plus t squared plus u squared a u v plus uh, high order terms and this is the result of Komagotsky and Schremer. Komagotsky and Schremer. Okay. So the point is, if you study this system of mixed amplitudes, uh, you're not only uh, sensitive to the parameters of the sketchy amplitude, but you're also sensitive to the A anomaly of, of your UV CFT. And uh, the, the details are complicated, but the idea is simple. And let me just uh, skip uh, all the details, but show you the final plots, the ones you can get. Okay. Um, right. So here's the plot. Um, this is in, in my previous notation is lambda zero zero. Yeah. And this is in my, my notation is lambda two zero. So these are the parameters of the sketchy amplitude. And this object is the A anomaly in the VCFT. And uh, I remind you, if you have energy, if you have uh, in, in the UV CFT, just uh, scalar part, uh, the scalar field, the bosonic field, CFT, um, if it's just uh, minus d phi squared, in these units, A over A3 is one. Anyway, the parameter which we found, ah, right, so, sorry, one correction. So on the horizontal axis here is the parameter lambda zero zero, which I had before. And uh, in this plot, uh, uh, I had to, multi um, right. So on, on this plot is my previous parameter lambda zero zero divided by 32 pi. That's why before I had big numbers like 600 and here I have small numbers. So it's uh, 32 pi. Good. And uh, this boundary, for instance, here is the allowed part. And that's what you can get from the pure S matrix bootstrap. And here's the allowed part. However, for each allowed value of lambda zero zero, you can uh, minimize the, the A anomaly in the UV CFT. And basically what we discover is that the, the A anomaly, the minimum value of the A anomaly must be around uh, 0 0.4. So it cannot go down. So in other words, the main results of, of these plots, you can say that in the UV CFT, you have to have at least A anomaly to be 0 0.4 at, at the very least in order to produce one particle at low energy. Uh, yeah, one particle state which scatters, no matter what deformation you have. Do these results also apply to deformations that are generated by VEVs or things that are not turned on by a relevant operator? Yes, very good. Um, 
So if we take, for, for example, the n equal four uh, young meals in four dimensions. So there is a range of parameters uh, which uh, brings you to the uh, column phase where uh, some operators develop a vacuum expectation value, your conformal symmetry breaks spontaneously. And then the, you get a massless particle, the massless uh, uh, Goldstone boson due to the spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is called the dilaton, the physical dilaton. And uh, I think you can apply this technology, but you have to modify it a little bit. And the reason is that when you introduce your probe field, uh, you send its coupling to infinity. Well, it's inverse coupling. So it's, it's completely decoupled in this limit. And instead, when uh, F is, uh, well, when you have a spontaneously broken conformal symmetry, then F is the physical, uh, physical coupling. And it just has number. It's just a number, which you cannot send to, to infinity. And uh, this will complicate the setup. So the, the bounds directly do not apply, but you can maybe with enough work, you can, uh, you can do that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to, 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 to let me point out one thing. So in four dimensions, we have a very little number of examples of conformal field theories. So we know for, for ages, uh, the bang zachs theories uh, Cas Cas Caswell Bing Zach theories. Uh, and even in perturbative regimes, they're not computed systematically. Uh, and we have free theories. So that's what we know. And we have supersymmetric theories, but I'm not familiar too much with uh, modern results, so I cannot comment on it. But uh, so what we know that the free boson is here. If you take a free fermion or uh, or Free, free, I mean, the value of the A anomaly is one. If you take free fermion or free gauge field, they're like, they shoot up, they're like 10 or like a round of 100. So they go very high up. And uh, this range of A anomalies between zero and one, they are, well, we don't know if there are any theories uh, uh, in, the, in this regime, conformal field theories. And I think this is a very important question to answer in, in, in the future. Uh, from using conformal bootstrap, can we uh, run the numerical bounds and say that a anomaly in conformal field theory should be greater than one, or it can be less than one? The current bound now, your entirety bound is zero. So any a anomaly starting from zero is allowed from CFT. So our results suggest that you might have some conformal field theories which sit below one. However, one can also say, if you're pessimistic, you can say, well, in your setup, you don't have enough constraints and maybe, yeah, the bound is very weak and it's unphysical. This remains to be seen. Okay, so this concludes my part on discussing S matrix uh, uh, bootstrap and constraints. Any questions? All right, very well. So, uh, David, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about conformal field, uh, conformal field theories, but I think is uh, is uh, too much. I think we should uh, we should skip it. As you wish, Danny. Um, I, in principle, you could continue for 15, 20 minutes, depending on uh, how dense is the discussion. But you feel free to do what you prefer. I mean, if there are some discussion that can be can be started now, maybe we can uh, talk about them rather than uh, starting a new topic, but uh, let's see. Right. If someone uh, has uh, questions yes. or uh, different points to rise. Let me ask something very imprecise. Can we define some A anomaly in the epsilon expansion? 
and is it clear that say in the Wilson Fisher fixed point, the, the this such an anomaly with only drop by epsilon amount, or that it could jump some finite amount, even as epsilon goes to zero? I, I know it's a bit yes, 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 yes. No, no, it is uh, clear. So you, you would think if, if you can do that, you can use your epsilon expansion to get some feeling about the anomaly. Uh, right. I don't think you can do that uh, because, because anomalies, they're very much dimension dependent. Uh, for instance, uh, Yeah, so I don't think you can do it. Uh, for instance, uh, if you take the case of tooth anomaly, there's there's a statement that tooth anomaly is is uh, in uh, UV CFTs. If you take so suppose I have some global symmetry, global uh, symmetry, and let let me say U one then this global symmetry has a current g mu. Uh, it, we, we can study now in, take the UV CFT. Um, UV CFT. And in two dimensions, I can study the, uh, the two point function, j mu, j nu. So this uh, two point function, it will have two tensor structures, it will have coefficient cj which is normally called this the the uh, central charge and this uh, t is the tensor structure so normally two point functions in cfts they have one one tensor structure and uh, and uh, in two dimensions only they can have two and the second part let me call it tj prime is uh and this is some other tensor structure. Tensor structure. So this this thing is called the central charge, and this is the tooth anomaly. This coefficient is the tooth anomaly in two dimensions. But uh, if you go to three dimensions, the tooth anomaly does not exist at all, <laughs> right? And if you go to four dimensions, the tooth anomaly is actually sitting inside the Three point function. Right. And uh, well, let me call it lambda, the tooth anomaly. And there is only one tensor structure here. So here's the tooth anomaly. Yeah, so the, the answer is I think no. So it's very much dimension dependent. And in most of dimensions, there are no anomalies actually. I see. Thank you. You prefer to stop here, Dennis, or do you want to say something more? I can I can say one more thing. Uh, let me just uh, say one more thing. Uh, it uh, will be very non-detailed. And what I would like to say is, um, so just to summarize uh, my lecture notes. So let, let's say summary. So yesterday I talked about uh, non-perturbative definitions of QFTs. perturbative uh, definitions of quantum field theories, uh, which are UV complete. And then here I discussed uh, that they start with some UV CFT and generically they end up with IR CFT. In some cases, this IR CFT can be empty So you get a mass gap, mass gap, and then you can define particles. In this particular case, when you define particles, you can use, uh, uh, then you can use scattering methods, scattering amplitude methods. Okay. 
Then I also mentioned uh, some result, uh, some some techniques like lattice, uh, just the presence, what they can do, and Hamiltonian truncation. And I showed, for example, in the case of Hamiltonian truncation plus bootstrap, uh, just results how you what kind of what kind of things you can compute. In particular, I, I showed you that you can compute observables in five to the four theories. And then what I discuss uh, is unitarity. Unitarity is a tricky business in quantum field theories, and uh, I propose I discussed a very nice way to construct semi-positive definite matrices. With definite matrices. And you can get a lot of intuition uh, from there, uh, both analytically, and you can use them directly with numerics because of the SDPB software. And uh, today I discussed, uh, I went into details of the S matrix bootstrap methods. And I discussed two variations. I, I discussed the dispersion relations, uh, which are analytic and known for, 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 for a long time, and the numerical methods, which are much uh, more powerful for non perturbative field theories. And I showed you the comparison. And then finally, I talked that you can actually extend your S matrix bootstrap uh, philosophy to, uh, to actually probe uh, some UV CFT data. And I showed you some of the uh, results uh, I have. And finally, to conclude things I wanted to talk about, but uh, I went over time, I want to talk about the conformal bootstrap. And uh, what is good about the conformal bootstrap is that every step there is rigorous. And what it does, this conformal bootstrap, it, uh, it hopefully, well, for now, it doesn't look maybe that good, that, that promising, but the dream would be to uh, classify all, all the CFTs. And why it is very important is because UV complete conformal field theories, uh, UV complete quantum field theories, they start with a CFT and they end with the CFT. So the conformal bootstrap can, can tell you what kind of start and end of RG flows are allowed or not. And this uh, special set of techniques developed in the last uh, 10 years, uh, which uh, well still I think will, will bring a lot of new results. Okay, so I, I'll conclude here. Yeah, if there are questions, we can uh, discuss a bit. So please ask if you have any. OK. It seems there are no. So let's conclude here. Let's stop here. So first I wanted to thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. I personally appreciated uh, a lot of the content and I, I like the what you presented and I think all the audience will agree with me. And uh, thanks also to the audience for the for taking part and uh, joining the discussion. Very, very nice. It was, uh, this was good for sharing ideas. And uh, that's all for this uh, couple of lectures. I hope we can, uh, we can meet again for the next uh, appointment, which will be, I think, in two weeks, one or two weeks. Yeah, you, will, uh, you will get a reminder. So just a technical point concerning the material of the lecture. That this, Denix, I also take the opportunity to ask you, would you share your slides with me so that I can upload them on the website and everybody that is interested can download from them? Absolutely, I will do that uh, later yeah. in the afternoon. The recording will be instead uh, will be instead uh, put on the website of the DGI. So at the web page of the DGI in the section of the theory lectures, you can find uh, all the material.
Fantastic. And, uh, that's all. So it was a pleasure. Thank you again, Dennis. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, thank you, Davide. No worries. Uh, thank you, everyone who, who participated. Uh, have a great day to everyone. Bye, Bye too. Thank you all. Bye.